Hello and welcome back to another Plex test. For today's video, we are looking at the relatively new TSH886 from QNAP. It is a Xeon powered NAS here, a quad core Xeon powered NAS that utilizes QUTS Hero. That is their ZFS file system software. We've got Plex installed, we've got the same files to always test, and we're going to test it the way we always do. This is a non-GPU equipped CPU, it worth, it's worth highlighting, but it does score remarkably high. This system arrives for around, uh, depending on whether you go for the four hard drive or six hard drive version, somewhere between 1500 to two grand. So this is not a budget solution, but it is a tiered solution. And this system we're utilizing today also has SSD caching enabled in the background. I'm mentioning that, but it's also worth highlighting that the SSD cache is going to be little to no benefit in these tests due to the size of some of these files, and we've not given this system time to burn in on that caching. That's a completely separate video, but it is worth highlighting that there are lots of tiny benefits to a ZFS powered NAS system, such as those of uh, compression and deduplication, which again are good, but ultimately have little or no impact in the scope when it comes to Plex Media Server. I just thought I'd volunteer those off the bat. Obviously, we are still using OBS for our screen recording, and this is being recorded during uh, the second lockdown here in the UK. So at the moment, I'm in quite a closed off area for this recording, and you can probably hear a number of NASs behind me that are populated with quite enterprise grade hard drives clicking and whirring in the background. Um, so I apologize if that's getting picked up there. There's not a vast amount I can do about that, but Let's go straight into this. So as you can see here is the H886 on the left We are going to make sure at all times that not only are we logged in But we've got the resource monitor on screen as well now at the moment There is a few little bits and bobs happening in the background of this device uh, And obviously as it's a ZFS file system NAS system the memory will get eaten up a little bit on this now we do have another test coming up soon with another ZFS NAS, the H7973AX, uh, and that's one to stay tuned for soon. Okay, so now we've got the resource monitor up and running there on the QNAP side of things. We can take a good look at the Plex side of things there. Now, on this side, we can have a look in the server itself. If we go into the Manage Server Settings, open up that menu there, we'll be able to see that I have given access uh, for Plex to utilize transcoding actions and really punish the CPU with no limitation. This CPU does not feature any kind of embedded back graphics, doesn't have a transcoding engine, so everything being done today is going to be done with raw horsepower. Uh, first up, as always, we're going to go with a nice, easy, straightforward file to play with the transcoding, um, and this is going to be the Matrix, 20 years old, it is a 720p file, and this file is one that we're going to play with and downscale it in a number of ways. Um, so let's go ahead and play that file straight off the bat. Of course, I have muted the system in advance due to the YouTube bots. But as you can see, we're watching the film there. It is over the local area network. We can skip forward. It's going to play absolutely fine. And on the left-hand side of the screen there, you're going to be able to see the metric there for the CPU and memory utilization. And this is set to one minute at the moment. So if we go to the settings, we're currently viewing it in chunks of one minute. So if we up that, date that to five minutes, what's going to be useful there is we're going to be able to have some comparison data between testing. Um, mainly the one we're going to be looking at here is the used tab there. So we want to see how much memory is being used at all times. But it is worth highlighting there are a few background operations taking place at all times and you've got those sort of lighter metrics there as well so let's start playing around with transcoding here so first and foremost let's get that knocked down nice and easy it's going to let it do the automatic conversion and that's when plex will choose the most benefiting uh transcoding based on the data around you can see it's put it um, in fact it's gone up to 1.4 at 720p so for now let's go for some forced transcoding let's go down to a 480p 480p nice and quick instantaneous there was a tiny spike there on the cpu during the course of the automated check-in now we'll switch to a uh, 2040p 
And as you can see, we're going to start to see pixelation there throughout this, because obviously this is designed for fantastically metered uh, bandwidths, as well, of course, as those on smaller devices with smaller screens. I appreciate in 2020 that very few people are ever going to watch these files at this low quality, but you know, it's nice to have that option, particularly for smaller, less important files. Even right the way down to this potato mode here at 160p, when I'm having any difficulty, there's a tiniest delay skipping forward, but that's been fairly standard with every device that we've ever tested. But I think for now, that's pretty much telling everything we need to know. Just double checking the screen recording. So we can come out of that file and now go into something 1080p based. So for now, we're going to make our way into uh, Little Shop of Horrors. As before, old film, upscaled. It's an H.264 file that is running at 1080p, and I believe this is 3 megabits per second. Uh, bit rate, so if we go in and just go ahead and straight away play that file, it's 1.9 megabit, I say. Uh, we can go there, and again, we can skip forward. This is a movie playing over the network, nice and simple. Skip back and forward, looking absolutely fine. No surprise there's whatsoever. So let's go ahead. This time go down once again to 720p at 4 megabits per second. And again, we can skip. We can play. We can watch. It's going absolutely fine skipping through this film. Next, let's go down to 480p this time. Give the movie a second. We're going to keep a little eye on the CPU and memory utilization there. There was a slight delay there. And if we skip around, that uh, uh, delay is definitely evident there. And this is something we've noticed before with any of these NASs that we've chosen to downgrade uh, from a 1080p to a 480p. There's certainly something of a resolution conflict across most of these devices. Um, in that, there's a delay. It is getting it done, but we're certainly seeing utilization uh, peak a little bit there. So now let's go down to 240p. Give that a second. It's thinking about it and it is playing, but there's no avoiding that 1080p to 420p with a non-GPU encoded CPU is pushing things a little bit. And we're going to see probably a more fleshed out um, source of information there when we look at some of those bigger jellyfish test files. So let's go down to 160p now, right down to the lowest possible potato mode. And it is playing. There's a slight delay there. And if we weren't skipping back and forward over the network, no doubt this would play without hesitation all the way through. But for me, that's kind of telling me enough there. Although the CPU utilization is a little higher than I would have liked. I would have liked. But again, we are talking about a non-GPU enabled processor there. So now we make our way into the test files. Let's lay those out in the way that's easiest to see them. And as discussed before, and if you've watched any of my other Plex videos, you'll know this already, but I'm sorry to be repetitious, but it's worth highlighting that the majority of NAS systems will always play H.264 a great deal better than HEVC, otherwise known as H.265, as well as 10-bit H.265. This is because a lot of the time of the hardware architecture not having uh, either the licensing or the codec support to play these. Now, QNAP does have a number of improvements in its app center that you can go ahead and install for additional drivers for multimedia playback as well as um, CAN. CAN being a media signage and licensing program that allows you to uh, play back 265 a great deal better, but it does have paid subscriptions in the background there. It's not a first party product. It's um, a little bit third party there, and that's why they don't shout about it too much. But if you do want to improve H.265 playback, I recommend looking into that program to find out more about it. If we open it up there, you can see it requires the licensing to proceed. On top of that, you can go again into that center there, and there are multimedia add-ons that you can chuck on too. But we're going with the vanilla mode here. We're going to go through some of these. So once again, the 264s, I've pretty sure they're all going to play absolutely fine there's the jellyfish file 30 seconds and as you can see the buffering has been near enough instantaneous the files playing back perfectly and it is that 1080p which we can play and downgrade and once again we'll have a look at that file and how the transition takes place and now we can see a little bit more information about how the buffering is reacting to this so as we see that transition um, into that mode definitely took a little bit of a toll. 
Same goes if we switch now to potato mode at 160p. We can see it working. It just took a little bit of time to commit to that conversion. So again, if we do exactly the same file at nearly exactly the same weight, this time at H.265, we are going to see very, very different results. For example, it's going to go straight into a conversion there. That's not one that we've actioned. It's one that it's going to do it itself. And therefore, we are immediately transcoding now. We are transcoding at 1080p by default. So again, we can play around and switch to some of those other settings, but it's going to be that extra tier of work for the system. Now, it's going to be able to do it, I'm sure, but while it does that in the background, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys that these files indeed are not on the SSDs. These aren't. There are no SSD volumes on this. Oh, sorry, not volumes. This is a ZFS. No um, SSD storage pools. The SSD are only being utilized for caching, which you're not really going to see the benefits within uh, Plex Media Server. So if we go in, we can have a look at the Plex test, and we can see that those files for the testing are all here on the hard drives, not the SSDs. Now, if we move into the 10-bit file, we're going to see largely the same as we saw previously. Even though all these files are all 3 megabit per second, as you can see, it's got to boot straight into the conversion. And we can skip forward and stuff like that. We can go ahead and these files will play. But we're going to see a little bit of lagginess if we do the skipping back and forward as well as for the initial conversion because of that necessity to transcode H.265 or HEVC. So now we're going to start scaling through these. I'm going to stop playing back H.264, maybe one last one just to make a point, uh, because H.264 we know is going to play like an absolute dream on this device. And again, that's in original format. And you know, if you don't believe me, we can go ahead and go even deeper. Let's go for the heaviest H.264. We've got one right there in 1080p at least we've got a 4k as well and as you can see playback absolutely fine 100 megabit file quite a chunky one at that playing it absolutely fine the caching is only just ahead of playback it has to be said due to the lack of a transcoding engine but it's still doing a very good job there and if we scale down we're probably going to see a little bit of conflict going from the 1080p to the 480p something we've already seen in the previous testing of this device. Uh, we're seeing those spikes as well uh, in the background there on the CPU utilization, which is certainly something to keep an eye on, as well as that memory utilization of what's free, what is being utilized by ZFS Arc for caching, which is quite useful as well, and all of that happening in the background in real time. If we go, while we're looking at H.264 files, we can go ahead and look at a big old 4K h264 at 200 megabits this is quite a monster of a file this is the largest h.264 uh, 4k uhd file i have and it's a 200 megabits per second file and we are seeing a little bit of struggle we may have bitten off more we can than we can chew with this file and one of the earliest indicators i can see here is that the cpu has given up the ghost on this file we're not seeing the spike and chances are it's going to kick us out of the Plex UI in a moment. We can try and go for the automated conversion. And we'll let the NAS in the background have a little think about that. To see if it can convert this beast of a 4K H.264 into something we can play back here. But even looking at it here, the CPU has jumped up quite significantly here. And it has hit 100% their utilisation. So it's at least attempting the conversion rather than try and play back the original. But we can already see that CPU dip down just a little bit there. And it is still trying. We've seen the caching, but unfortunately it has kicked us out. So I think that's our limitation with regards to H.264. But if we scale down, we can make our way back to the H.265 file. So I'm only going to focus on the H.265. So we're going to go for a 10-bit H.265, 10 megabits per second file. We're going to go ahead and play that. The caching has begun. That CPU, once again, due to its lack of embedded graphics, is spiking quite significantly high early doors, and playback is going to happen. But playback isn't alarmingly faster than transcoding. And now, these test files are only um, 30 seconds long, so again, it may pan out over time 
that the playback outpaces buffering. But if we scale that back, but this time we change the file format to something a little smaller. Let's knock it down to a 720p. We can see how the system's going to deal with this conversion. And the CPU is spiking there on the left hand side of the screen. It does look like playback is going to happen here, which again is lovely to see. So now we're going to move from 10 into the 30s. And again, we're going to go into a 30 megabits per second H265. That's three times uh, the megabits per second here. And again, it's going to go boot straight into uh, conversion because it's an H265. And as you can see, the buffering is taking place and it is going to play back in a moment. CPU utilization pretty high to be expected here, but it is still playing back this file. So lots of stuff there. If we full screen it, we can see nice and clearly that the file is indeed playing back the way we wanted it to all the way through. So now we're going to go even bigger. We're going to go for 100 megabits per second, H265. And again, this is the last 1080p H265 file we have before we move into the 4K arena. Um, I think for the most part, this has played back everything so far, apart from that big old chunky 4K uh, H264. But I think this is where we're going to start to see a little resistance. Not a huge amount, because it's still transcoding that file. And I would argue that the playback versus buffering isn't getting too bad. Although I do believe over time, looking at the pacing here, that I think playback, if this was a longer file, playback would override uh, buffering. And then, of course, you would end up with stilted playback with stop, start, stop, start. But it did seemingly complete that row. Uh, so now let's move up to 120 megabits per second, but this time 4K. And this is an H.265 10-bit. And this is where the H.264 kind of fell over. So we're going to let this do its thing. We're going to keep an eye over here at the metrics for uh, the CPU. And of course, the memory utilization here along the line. It's giving it a damn fine try. The caching is taking place, and by caching, I of course, mean uh, buffering. And I think we're going to see playback. But I do not think that playback is going to um, be outpaced by the buffering. It's going to be an exceptionally close race here uh, for these two. And again, do bear in mind that this is the kind of file format at this point where we are talking crazy town files this is not a small file and as you see playback has hit buffering and of course the system is still conducting all of that transcoding there in the background and it will restart in just a second so we were kicked out before the end of that playback so i can't really call that a success but let's move on to some of the higher tiers just to see how they pan out so this is the 200 megabits per second 4K 10-bit H265. Let's click play there and see how that comes about. And again, I do think we're starting to see the limits here. But I will say, over all of the Plex testing that I've been doing on NASIS throughout 2020, I would argue that this has probably done the best so far. Uh, the reason being that CPU, although it isn't embedded graphics, it is fantastically powerful. Um, I'd love to be able to isolate if there are any advantages to a ZFS powered NAS for uh, Plex Media Server transcoding. But I will say at this high tier, a good 70 to 80% of the NAS that I featured this year could not even attempt to play this file with this file already caching at this point but playback as you can see is just gonna hit caching right there and whether it plays back again or kicks us out that's not ideal this is still a tremendously huge file and if we go for automated conversion which is what it's doing or go for the plex automatic trans transcode chances are these files are going to play back and we will be able to play them back in a more reliable fashion. But the original picture quality there is something I think that Plex is going to struggle with. We're seeing here the CPU is giving it a damn fine try there in the background, but alas, no. So let's go straight to the last test file. This is the 400 megabits per second 4K UHD H265 10-bit file. This is a behemoth. This is a 30-second file that is uh, more than a gig in size, I believe. 
Um, just to put that into perspective, uh, you've got to remember all of the files that we've tested during the latter portion of today's testing have been part of the Jellyfish test files. And if you have a look at them here, the largest file that we're trying to play here is 30 seconds long and is 1.4 gigabytes in size. The first files were as little as 10 megabytes. That is absolutely huge and that's a lot of data to handle, especially if you need to convert it due to the H.265 limitations and to do with the CPU not having embedded graphics. So this is very much top end. If that's what 30 seconds of film is, imagine a movie like Avengers, which is a good, what, two and a half hours long? Imagine the size of that file if it was uh, portrayed in this raw MKV format. So once again, in all of these tests, stay grounded and understand that the file size you're looking at here is so wildly top end that I don't expect any NAS, I repeat, any NAS to be able to play back this file easily. It's either going to use all or most of the resources or flat out die. And so far, this system has done better than any other. So let's play that biggest file. That's the 1.4 gigabyte 30 second file. 400 megabits per second, 4K UHD H265. An absolute behemoth. And it is trying. Look at that down there. Absolute trooper. We are getting some caching here in the background while the conversion takes place between H265 to something the system is prepared or allowed to play. And it is trying. But I do think that CPU is going to top out. Are we going to get even a few seconds of playback from this behemoth of a file? No, unfortunately not. The caching could have stood a chance, but no. If we try again, but this time we're going to pause it and allow the system to do a little bit of background caching. Now, I do not consider what I'm doing right now to be a fair test. This last segment is not what I'm going to call uh, a success. This is just some idea of what would happen if the system was able to cache that little bit faster than playback. What would have happened? So don't count what I'm doing right now as a fair test because it isn't. The deck is rigged in this final test and needs to be treated as such. It is doing a damn fine job of uh, getting that file cached though. We're up to six, seven, eight. I'm going to click play once it hits 10 seconds just to see what it can do. We're almost there. Do you know what? Wild abandon. Let's click play. And yes, given sufficient time for buffering, this system can do the job. But again, we're not going to call this last test anything but a little simulation. But this has been my Plex tests of the QNAP TSH886 ZFS NAS. It's a beast. It's not the cheapest. But if you're looking at multimedia, this is definitely one for you. If you aren't looking at some of the more modern solutions, such as the soon-to-arrive for Plex testing 88X series, arriving with its own Xeon but with embedded graphics, I'm not going to you know, lay it too thick, guys, but I think that might be the best Plex NAS of the year when it arrives. You heard it here first, but let's wait until the testing to see if it can live up to the challenge. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. Click like if you did and click subscribe to learn more. There's always Plex tests to be done and I will keep doing them. I know a number of you that have watched these videos have highlighted that you would like ideally to see a lot more of these tests being conducted um, on a client device such as an Amazon Fire Stick and more and I will get round to those eventually. The reason I don't really touch on those is there's a lot of variables that are very distinctive to everyone's network environment and tests like this give us a, a much more malleable environment where we can affect transcoding and push those things something we can't really do with some client devices but thank you so much for watching visit the links in the description and stay tuned next time for another plex video i will see you next time